Welcome back. We're now going into module three. And I'm going to start this off and, and get into our, our printing and play to and push stuff. We're going to let Jeremy have a little time to uh, <laughs> recover survive and recover with his voice. Uh, so, but uh, we're really excited about this module. I call it the triple P threat. We've got printing, play to, and push notifications. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be a, a lot of fun. So let's go ahead and get started. You can see that module three is uh, right before our break for the midday. And although printing and play two are mentioned there, we are, of course, going to cover uh, push notifications as well. Because it's on the exam. It's on the exam. And, but uh, more importantly, that one is going to definitely probably get used. So, for sure. uh, as all of these could be. Uh, the first topic for sure is going to be printing. And then we're going to follow through. And, and if you haven't heard of it before, you're going to find out what this whole play to thing means. And then finally, we might even get Jeremy to talk again. And uh, we'll see if he has anything to say about push notification services. But we'll start now with printing. So, this is uh, the cool story to give about printing. The three items that are being seen on the screen right now are kind of the three different ways you can think about printing from an app perspective. Uh, for starters, your users are going to get to a point where they're inside of an app and once they really get the new UI, they're going to start invoking those charms a lot more. And one of those charms will show devices that would be relevant to whatever the task is at hand. And sometimes that relevant task is printing, which means a printer might show up as a device in the charms. Well, imagine they're in, their, in your app, and they want to print something, and they go to the charm, and they just don't see a printer listed. So that's one of those things. Another is that your app could actually give them the ability to print, you know, explicitly. And then finally, you may want to have control over the options and over what would actually be printed. So that's what we're going to be uh, considering. And there is no finer way to do so than through a demonstration. So that's what we're going to be getting into right now. And I'm going to go ahead and open up the Code Show app. and navigate over to the how to print from the app. So I'll click on there. Now it says, oh, this example shows how easy it is, and I mean it. It's really easy. Let me show you why it's so easy. Let me scroll over here, and you can see right now uh, that what it's saying is you can toggle you can register or unregister print. And then I give this little clue to those who would be using this. Invoke the device charm. You could do that with the Windows key K. That specifically will bring up all the devices that are available. So that's, you might be thinking, why not Windows P for print? Well, this is more about what devices are relevant. And so Windows K, what does K have to do, <laughs> do with devices? I haven't figured it out yet. <laughs> but that is the shortcut to use to, to pull up the devices. Now, if you want printing to be enabled or disabled when the users actually toggle or, or go there, then you better make sure that you've registered print. So I am going to show you the code for this, but before I do it, let's actually see what this looks like. I'm going to go into the uh, app, and, and you notice I have a, a setting here that says it's unregistered. I'm going to do Windows key, or Windows K, excuse me. That pulls up devices. It says, this app can't send to other devices right now. Now, it shows the second screen if I wanted to enable that. But other than that, the, the main ingredient or the main focus of this right now is this is your default behavior. If you have an app, your default behavior is you've done nothing to suggest that there's anything, anything that you should be printing. So keep that in mind. OK, so with that said, I'm now going to click on the toggle button. When I clicked on toggle, it says it's now registered. Now I'm going to show you how exhaustive that code looks in a second. But before I do, let's now do Windows K, Windows key K again. 
and my goodness, there's a, there's a whole bunch of options. So one that would be fun to explore is PDF Lite. So I'm going to click on that, and you'll see that I have some options made available to me for printing. Now what it's doing is it's actually extracting what it perceives to be the current document at this time and taking that. So I didn't have to do anything uh, fancy in the background. It actually just kind of does this by default. But I'm going to show you what that code looks like right now. So see the code. And the uh, significant thing to look at, oh, wait, that's right, I get to do this. Now you get to touch it. I get to touch again. <clears throat> so when I clicked on the uh, toggle print, that took me to a toggle print function. And I think the, the key ingredient here uh, to seeing how this is going to work, it, you want to look at this line right here. You see, this is the uh, event if a print task is requested. Printer came from this line here where I was going to the print manager and asking for a current view. Now, that print manager is an alias that I have defined up above in this code file. But the key here is that line where you could see that the on print task requested now equals something is basically saying, oh, someone cares about printing. In other words, if you leave that with nothing assigned to it, it means, well, you don't want to print. But the moment you assign it something, oh, that means something cares. There's a listener that cares about printing. That's how you toggle it on. It's really that simple. Just just to uh, get printing enabled. And once you have actually assigned what the event handler is, in this case, the event handler is called print doc, then I'd want to scroll down below and take a look at that print doc event. So this is really what they mean when they say implement a contract in Windows 8, right? Well, when, when you say implement a contract, in, in this example, <coughs> if you meant by contract meaning that I have defined something that is actually being handled by that event handler, then yes, if, if that's what you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, it seems simple when you look at it in the code, because all you're really doing is creating an event handler for an event. But uh, at a high level, what you're doing in that case is you're implementing one of the Windows 8 contracts. You're doing something a certain way so that the user's app is able to respond based on the hardware or based on the, the operating system's functionality. So when the operating system says, hey, I've got a search request for you, or hey, I've got somebody that wants to print, that's being sent to your app and implementing the contract is really just a matter of creating the event handler for those events, and then all of a sudden it works like it's supposed to. Exactly. And in fact, what you probably discover is that that's going to be a common theme even with the next topic, and that is it's really about just making that event handler available that says, I care, so I'm going to adhere to that contract. <laughs> and in this example, when I said, I do care about printing because I'm going to give you an event handler to go to, when we now look at the event handler, we can see, well, how simple it really is to get started. Uh, in fact, if I go to the top of the screen here, you'll see that the uh, print doc takes in a print event and what I could do is find out what the task is that's being created. And the next line, which takes the, the uh, arguments that are being passed over here for this uh, particular task, is saying, hey, let's set the source for the print job to just basically be this document. I mean, that's all it is. It's just saying, uh, let's go ahead and grab the source for this document. And the only other thing I do is I say, when this task is completed, uh, is there anything I'd want to do from there, and so I did say yes, go to the print task completed uh, function, which is if there's any last things I want to do, uh, record something or do, you know, have something else happen from the application. So this is, it's optional, but I definitely needed to have the event handler for the print uh, associated up top, which we did do. So I'm going to go back over to the app again. and. I want to move on to the next demo. So I'll see the demo. We basically just saw what registering means is registering an event handler. That's all we meant there. Now we're going to invoke print without having to go to the charm. So in the, in the last example, I did Windows 
uh, key, then the K as a combination, and that pulled up the charms bar, and then I was able to see the devices. But what if I want to invoke that functionality straight from the app? Well, I took the lazy route here, and I actually just created a print button. Uh, more than likely, I, I probably would have made this even uh, potentially uh, a command in the command bar at the application bar at the bottom. But for right now, uh, I can click on that print, and when I do so, it, again, it shows me the options of what it is that I could possibly do. Again, I could choose a PDF Lite. And there's something different with this version versus the last version. The last version took in the entire document, but I specifically said the only thing I want you to print is the little section on the page where it starts with invoke print, wow, printing is fun, and the print button. And you'll notice that's the, it's, it's very small, but that is the only thing that is in that print document right now is that little tiny section. In other words, there is a way for you to say, I don't want to print everything that's on the screen. I do, however, want to print a, a particular section of the screen. So let's see what that looks like when I say see the code. And I will cruise over here to the print.js and show you the specific line that's making that possible. I call it a uh, print frag. So I'm going to zoom in for a second. And let's take a look at that print frag function. It's doing the same thing that we saw before in terms of an event handler, but you'll notice that the key difference is this line here that says, no, we're going to go to the document and create a document fragment. Now this is key. You cannot just pass an element in your HTML page in uh, to, to be used for the source. You must pass in a document and valid options there would be a document fragment it, it could be the document from an iframe or it could be the document on your page it cannot be element specifically so it must be one of those so i created a document fragment then what i did is i appended to that fragment content and i cloned it that's whether this clone node equals true uh, so clone that node true means and, and give me all of its uh, descendants as well and put it inside of this fragment. Then that's when I say, hey, HTML print document source, you are going to be based on the fragment alone, not on the entire document like we did in the past. So that's what makes that one uh, different. And now let's see one other thing that you could do. How about this is probably a valid scenario. I, I can imagine if, if uh, you and I were to think about it for a while, Jeremy, the, the idea of printing just what's on the screen is one thing, but can you imagine any kind of scenario where someone might want to invoke print and it may not actually be entirely visible on the page or not on the page at all? Uh, as far as thinking of an example, um, it seems like, you know, a lot of times on web pages, there's the, the print version of the page. So the, web, the one that you see on the screen, you want it to act a certain way, but then there's always this button that uh, the developer is, is forced to implement where it takes them over to the print-friendly version, might open in a new window, and then that's the version that you would want to invoke the print on. So maybe something like that. Exactly. I was thinking the same thing. Uh, it, it's a very common user experience now, especially on the web, for people to see the screen with all the menus and all that kind of stuff, but then you'll see some kind of button that says, just give me the printable version. Well, that's kind of what I already did in the last demo. What I'm going to showcase right now is a way that you could not only create custom content that doesn't even show on the screen, but how you can control the options over that print operation as well. So let's see it in play first. I'll demo it, and then we'll go take a look at the code. So I'm going to click print here, and I'll choose the PDF light again. And you'll notice that inside the print job, first of all, it's in landscape orientation. The, the other two examples weren't. I don't have any other options here. <laughs> I basically can print. Uh, there is a, a little link for more settings, but what it's giving me by default is here's the landscape. And then you'll notice there's this bold heading called custom printing. If you couldn't read that, that's what it says. And then all the little tiny print under here is just saying blah, 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 which is not over here in the app anywhere. So there is a way for you to create custom content without it actually having be, uh, be on the screen. So let's go see what that code looks like.
And I'll scroll over to our code file. Using touch, of course. Using touch makes me very happy. And now I will show the print frag with options. So I'm doing the same thing I did before. Here's where it gets a little interesting. I'm creating custom content now. I'm not just cloning content from what was on the page. I just created a header from nowhere and gave it its own text. I created a paragraph tag with all blah, 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 blah. Then not only did I add those two, I decided, hey, I'll add more blah, 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 and just clone that several times so that I have some content that's uh, filling the page. Here's where you can start to control the options. The print task options, which is right here, says clear everything that would be a displayed option. So I've, I've, in, in essence, what I've said is I don't want to give too many options here based on the kind of app. It could be maybe an internal type of app or it's, for whatever reason it's required, it must be landscape. And then uh, another thing I could, which is what I did here, the print task options orientation equals, and then this is an enumerated value all the way, and this ends with landscape. Uh, that's it. What I had uh, commented out was the ability to say, well, if I wanted to, I could have said, I'll clear all the options, but add just one. So one particular option that you might want to display would be, uh, how many copies do you want? So that, that could be an option. Uh, other than that, that's how the custom content got there, and that's how I was able to eliminate the options and create a print orientation that was landscape only. So going back over to the demo, and uh, seeing it in play again, once again, clicking print here meant creating a document frag that had nothing to do with this page, custom header, custom paragraphs underneath, clearing all the display options over here, and already setting it to a landscape. This is so easy to do. Almost everything that we've done with print so far it has been one-liners for the most part in terms of just saying, well, if I want landscape, that's a one line. If I wanted to create my own content instead of uh, using the document as a source, I could do that too. I absolutely am thrilled with how easy it is to implement print. I love the idea that if I just pass the document is, as the source, I, I'm, I'm done. It just recognizes the HTML source and says, okay, we'll, we'll go with that. So uh, very easy to implement. And if you haven't explored this one yet, uh, I think that you might start thinking, is there, are there some places in my app where my users would actually want to print something and not feel like, oh, what's this going to, <laughs> you know, what's this going to entail? How much work am I going to have to do? Remember, going back over to the screen, it's as simple possibly as just registering it. Just assigning that event handler and creating that function that says, okay, let me set the source argument to be, to be your document. <coughs> that can be as simple as it is for you to have a print solution in your application. And actually following that solution, there's a, a, there's a really good scenario you, in CSS and in HTML because you can use a media query that represents the printer. And so now you can just write your multiple views. All your layout and styling is done in CSS. You've got one document structure in HTML, but you've got all this layout and style that's just done differently on this size screen, this size screen, or, oh, by the way, this printer. So you, you, you add that query, uh, that media query, and then all of a sudden when you do the print, it just works, but it looks the way you want it to look on the printer. Absolutely. So before I leave this topic, I do want to stress where all this magic is kind of happening because I kind of bypassed it earlier. So let's, let's remember that this is really where the beauty of all of this is. Windows.graphics.printing.printmanager. I aliased it to print manager and then use that uh, down below. So if you want to implement this as well, you know, of course, uh, the code will soon be available in the store, but is already available at codeshow.coplex.com. Uh, all right. So that was our discussion having to deal with print. We're now going to switch gears to another kind of contract. And this one's a little special. This might not be one that would be used in all types of applications, but there is a, an audience for it, for sure. Play 2 
is the capability of setting up a device as the source of some media asset and setting up another device as a receiver of that media asset. So that's how you need to think about it at the basic level. There is a source, and I say media asset, meaning there's going to be some kind of uh, media, whether it be uh, pictures or video, where you're able to play from one device, but actually see it received and controlled in another device. The journey for putting this together, this Play 2 environment together, is exciting. <laughs> if you find this exciting, you know you're a geek. Yes. Exciting can have multiple connotations sometimes. Uh, one of the things that I think would be a nice little fireside chat to have on this discussion is that it is also one of the more difficult ones to uh, test and demonstrate to yourself. And having a little knowledge of what you need to do in order to make it all work for you uh, would be very helpful and probably more engaging for you to do instead of feeling like, well, I implemented the code, but I'm still not getting things to work. And so part of the discussion here is, do you have things ready to roll within your environment so that you can actually implement Play 2? So, let me make no mistake about it. The way Play 2 really works is based on two devices. Your, your objective here isn't to simulate it on your own machine. It actually defeats the purpose. Play 2 is all about going outside the boundaries of your device, whether you're the receiving end of it as a receiver of the Play 2 or the source of that particular information. So. You know, think of the scenario where you happen to have something within your home. Maybe it's in some kind of a, a room, maybe a server running in a closet somewhere, who knows, that might have a whole bunch of source of media, and yet now you have some devices in your home that you might want to play that to. And, and they can be receivers of that content, so you'd want to receive that. Or you can have a device where you say, hey, everybody gather around, I want to show you this right now. And you have that relationship between your device and another device, so it's just instantaneous, a way for you to do that kind of play to. So, what does it take to get this rolling? First of all, <laughs> it means that you need to be in the same network. It, it, that's very important for this all to work. If you're not in the same network, it's, it's not going to happen. So, that also suggests that your device, what you're going to be asking for in your capabilities in the application is that it has the ability to access the, the private network, uh, your local network. So, that's another thing that you have to add. Without that, it's pretty much a worthless uh, proposition. So, keep that in mind as well. Now, I'd like to show you something that we're probably going to see as a repeated pattern throughout the rest of the course today. And that is how you can tap into some other code samples very easily. Some of you may have seen some of these code samples before, but I'm going to show you a way that maybe you haven't seen how you can access it yet. So I'm going to uh, uh, move over into v Visual Studio. And at least I thought I was. I need to hit escape here. There we go. And let's go into Visual Studio. And even though I have my demonstration already up and ready to roll, what I want to do first is show you how you can get this code right now if you wanted to. <laughs> so I'm going to say File, New Project. That pulls up the New Project dialog box. And maybe you had not noticed this before, but down here, you have an online, and of course you need to be online, but if you're watching this, then I'm assuming you are. So you're online, and now I can click on the uh, samples for JavaScript, and specifically I can even start to search online and look for something like, uh, you know, the Play 2. Uh, it, of course, uh, IntelliSense started to kick in. So Media Play 2 sample in JavaScript which is what I've downloaded. Uh, there's also a, a Play 2 receiver a sample in JavaScript, which ironically, I did not install, but I know Mr. Jeremy did install on his machine. And we've discovered that we are on the same network. So that was very helpful for us to uh, possibly have this demonstration work. So here's what we're going to do. 
I'm not going to move forward with this, but I wanted you to see how you can find all these samples. They're available, and what's the benefit of doing it through this? Uh, do you have any uh, uh, feedback on that, Jeremy? What would you say is the advantage of getting your samples this way versus just trying to find them online? I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the answer. Okay. The answer is the JavaScript or all these samples that are available online, first of all, they're all here. Like I don't have to go everywhere on the web. They're all contained right here to find online. I can restrict it down specifically to JavaScript uh, if I wanted to. But even more importantly, and what I love the most about doing it this way, is that if you go online, what you're probably going to do is you're going to download some kind of a zip file somewhere. Then you're going to have to extract that zip file. You, you might need to remember to go to the zip package itself and go to the properties and then unblock. I mean, there's some, there's some potential uh, security things there, so you might have to remember to do that. If you do it this way, it installs the application so it's ready to roll right now. So you don't have to go through all that process of un, you know, unzipping and, and where do you want it to go. It'll, it'll ask you where you would like it to go if you're going to download it. So you'll have control over that, but then it's just ready to go. So, so that's one of the reasons why. Plus, because it's an extension now, updates to the projects mean you'll receive those updates too. You don't have to go back and re-download stuff. It'll say, there's updates available. Would you like to get the updates for this? Yeah, that's excellent. I think that's great. It is. So why not take advantage of that? So in, in, most of our demos are, are going to be showing Code Show because that's our, that's our baby. However, this is a great example of showing you how you can use the MSDN SDK samples to also uh, put this kind of demo together. So I'm going to ask Jeremy, do you happen to have that particular application up and running on your box? Yes. You do. Ready for you. He is ready. So what I am going to do. So I've installed the receiver. That's the one you want me to have running right now, right? That's correct. He is going to receive from my Play 2 sender. So I'm going to start to run mine. And what you can see here is that I can start, there's a, a video called uh, Big Buck Bunny. If you haven't seen it before, you can find it at the IE test drive. So this is ready to roll, but before I do that, I would like to go see uh, what devices I can play to. So Windows Key K again, and it says, oh, I don't have a, uh, a device that can receive to. So perhaps you might want to just uh, stop and start it again. Maybe it needs Stopping, to... Stopping, starting. says that the receiver is already started. Okay. And Windows key K again. You mean to close it down and reopen it? Yeah, you might as well do that. So while he's doing that, this is actually evidence, of course, that it's very important that you understand that you're truly on the same network and that your devices are communicating with one another. Okay, Let me see started. if that made any difference. There it is. So there's my Play 2 receiver, Jeremy, as he's named it. And now I'm going to click on that as the receiving element. Now notice when Whoa. I did that. Oh, so this, mine is in the lower uh, corner of the screen. His is actually playing. If I were to click pause right now, then it would pause his content on his device. There's no trickery here. The studio guys aren't, aren't trying to fool you. They're actually showing you two different devices. We promise. It's all a ruse. <laughs> so I'm now uh, saying I wanted to play again, and you can see it's actually playing. But wait, but wait, there's more. <clears throat> I'm going to go over to the slideshow. Wait, are you selling me a car, or are you showing me play to? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Now, because I stopped, when I chose a different scenario within this SDK sample, one of the things it does is it actually disconnects from the uh, receiver for that particular scenario. So I'm connecting to Jeremy's player again, and you'll see that every time I choose a different picture, then, of course, that's going to happen on the subsequent device as well. So uh, this is a really interesting scenario with regard to... Uh, app ideas. I almost kind of want to think of it as when, when you are creating any kind of content that you think could be good for a streaming media or streaming some kind of media asset to another device, why not think in terms of what we're, what we're doing here? And what I think is cool about what we're doing here is that we're demonstrating how to do both, both aspects of this. 
And that is not only are we printing, or, or not printing, excuse me, not only are we the uh, a source of this play to, we're also uh, having the ability to be the receiver. But where can you get this code? It's currently not being uh, shown in, in the Code Show app, but again, if we go back over into Visual Studio, I'm gonna go ahead and stop uh, the running of that. Keep in mind that you can get there by simply going to New, Project, and then switching into that online mode and finding both the Play 2 sender and the receiver in here. Now, we've talked about kind of how it works, but now what I want to show you is in, Vis in Visual Studio what the magic is behind the scenes. So I'm going to open up the first scenario and uh, show that code in full. And remember, when we were talking earlier, uh, Jeremy was mentioning the contract and you know what does it take to actually care or get engaged with any of the uh, things that we're doing and literally this is it so take a look here we have our video source our ID is our video source which truly is just a video tag in the H so there's nothing fancy here it's just a video tag but through this MS play to source dot connection dot add event listener we are responding to the state changed in error. When we do this, what we're saying in our code is, we care. We care. We want to be engaged with any kind of devices that might be out there. So by adding this event listener, we're actually playing part here with this play to option. Now, I think it's also interesting to note that, you know, I was, I was curious when I start, started to get into this, what are other Play 2 uh, scenarios that can be involved? There's actually an app, if you search in the store, that's called Play 2 Receiver. I mean, that, and its whole role is just to be that. And when, if you find it, uh, he actually does a little demo in his app uh, through a video that, that describes the fact that he's using it to play from his phone to his app. So think about that, devices that can communicate with each other like that. So he had an app on his phone that would be able to communicate with his receiver so that he could display content from his phone to his, uh, to his application on his machine. Uh, any kind of uh, media, think about whether it's for business use, for meetings, or whether it's uh, for home use and gathering the family around so everybody can see. You know, We're in an age now where it's really difficult to see the line between true business functionality or features in an app versus the consumer or the uh, the fun aspect of things. They're merging more and more. It's kind of hard to not notice that, you know, even in a business presentation, we start to see that blur into the personal side and back and forth where people on the personal side start to see the business side a little bit more. I think it's because whether you're talking about a work user or a home user, it just so happens they're both human beings. True. And they're both users. Yeah. <laughs> human <laughs> beings like human fluid beings. touch environments. They like things like play too. They, you know, sure. We love media. We're all, we're all humans. Absolutely. So that's really how easy it was to get connected uh, with this play to. Notice that even in our event handler, what we're primarily doing here is just querying the state. Uh, that's all we're doing here. The, the main activity was really in just listening and allowing that, that connection to happen through the contract. So uh, keep that in mind. Play2 is an awesome uh, opportunity to engage in your app if that's something that makes sense for your application to do. And I think that pretty much wraps up the demo on the Play2 sender and Play2 receiver. Recall that you can download both of those, but don't try them on the same machine. You have to have two devices in order for this to work. Now, did you show the code on the, uh, the receiver side for what happens at various events there? I didn't. Do you happen to have that available yeah, on your yeah, screen? Yeah, just real quick. Let me show you this. There's, there's actually an event that's captured for various media-related events. So whenever, for instance, the user turns the volume up or changes the rate of playback of a video, during any of these things, there's an opportunity for the receiver to determine what happens. So let's say the sender is turning the volume up continuously, but you'd rather, you'd rather 
rather capture that and say, wait a minute, I have some intelligent rules around volume levels, and so I want to I want to insert my own logic here. So that's that's possible. Excellent. Yeah, that's that's a that's a fun area. It's a, it's exciting to think of all the implications the way I might use this at home and my own network setup at home and. Um, uh, delight my guests with this technology. It'd be pretty, pretty fun. Absolutely. What I see also <clears throat> happening with this is the more that this is embraced, the more there will be a demand. Right. Uh, the more Play 2 receivers there are out there, the more opportunity there are for apps to also play with that. Because keep in mind that our apps, even though they were MSDN samples, they're essentially just that. They're, they, if he showed up as, a, as a, a device, so to speak, when I was saying, is there anything that's relevant to this? So there could be other ways that I might want to present that. That could be an opportunity for you to create a receiver that provides a value add other than just displaying something. Yeah, and these receivers aren't, this isn't just a Microsoft technology. This Play 2 is based on DLNA, and DLNA is a, is an, is a standard that a, a lot of different televisions and and, and who knows what else comply with. So there are going to be a lot of devices that you'll eventually be able to hook up with. Yes. Not eventually, today. Today. Today, <laughs> today right now. Think today. So let's return now to our module agenda. And we'll see that if, if Jeremy feels that he can uh, speak I'm on this topic. It. You're feeling, I'm feeling it? it. Okay. I am. I have to say that when I saw that this was one of our topics uh, when we were uh, getting ready to, uh, you know, look at all the content and prepare for this, this was one of the ones that I feel is like a game changer. It's it's the thing that can make or break an app in terms of really being the one that's catchy or sticky. Like the people will remember your app because of this. Yeah. Yep. So uh, definitely. I'll, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, actually, we're going to be talking about push notification. And uh, on a macro scale, this is really just the idea of being able to send notification events even when your app's not running. Okay, So you're going to go through some servers and be able to tell the machine that your uh, app has a notification to make even though your app's not running, there's no background task running, nothing like that. So that's, that's really important. The, the case, that, to your point, the case that really shows this off in my opinion is the other day when I had a and I was I was a bidder on an I was the high bidder on an auction <coughs> item on eBay, and then I got a notification that says you've been outbid, <laughs> and that's very timely, very important information because there's what an hour left on this auction and I just got outbid. I'm I need to get there now, and I need to. I need to make a new uh, bid because I've got to get this item. Sure. I mean, they call it winning. You don't, you don't really win anything. You still have to pay for it, but <laughs> right. I'm going to win this item, you know? And uh, so that's, that's one of those cases where it's not going to wait for me to open this app. It's not going to wait for a background task necessarily to be triggered, but uh, it's, it's important information for me to know right now. So that brings us into the topic of push notification. Now, I said that this is notifications. There are other ways, however, to trigger notifications. One of them is directly in your app. So if your app is running, it has the spotlight right now, you're on center stage and you can do what you want. You've got the processor, the other apps are stepped aside for yours, and you're free to push notifications, uh, toast notifications, tile notifications, all different kinds of notifications, all you now, if your app is not running, but rather you want to respond to something like the time zone change that Michael showed you earlier, then you can do notifications through a background task. There's no problem with that. The background task can issue the notification, and it's still coming from your device, from a process that you uh, created the code for. Um, that's just a different way to do it. But what we're talking about right now is using the push notification server to do these notifications, these toast notifications, tile changes, tile notifications, um, badge notifications. We're going to push these changes from the cloud directly to the device when your app isn't running and no background tasks are running at all. Okay. Now, I told you before in the media capture, there's an easy way and a powerful way. Now I'm going to show you that in the area of push notifications, there's the hard way, which is write your own service. 
or the easy way, which is use WAMs, okay? So I'm gonna take you through, oh, that's not even visible, but I'm gonna take you to a blog post here that I wrote called The Anatomy of a Push Notification. And I'm hoping that this gives you a good overview of it, all of the, uh, the architecture of this entire system, all the players involved, and what your role in the whole matter is, what you need to do in order to play along. So you can find this at um, codefoster.com slash anatomy of push. And the diagram here is important. The diagram is showing us that we've got a few players in the mix. <clears throat> the purple box on the left is Windows. That's the, that's the box, the device that you're running on, okay? Now the green boxes, the two on the top, those are the ones that you are responsible for writing the code for, okay? So I just want to, I don't want this to look like a big abstract architecture diagram that you don't really want to take the time to, to wrap your head around. I've, I've simplified this and, and I think it shows just the essence of the communication. So the steps are this, your store app, your store app, and let me get fancy not only with touch, oh, I'm, I'm actually I'm not in my uh, PowerPoint, no laser pointer. The, the Windows store app here is your app that you wrote the code for. Okay, your app at some point in time does a communication with the notification client platform. Now this is still on the computer. This isn't a server somewhere, this is still on the computer. So really this is super simple. It just amounts to a little API call that says to Windows, hey, I'm an app and I need a channel in order to do a push notification. So it asks Windows, can I please have a channel URI and Windows Behind the scenes, you don't have to worry about it. Windows goes and, and fetches this push, this push notification channel URL, gets it, and gives it to you. Simple API call, now you have a channel URI, okay? With that channel URI, you are now responsible for sending that channel URI to a web service. Now you've got to write this web service in, you know, uh, fundamentally, this is something that's in your realm of responsibility as a developer, so this, um, this cloud service. Now you're going to find a uh, secure way to get this channel URI up to that cloud service. Now once you've done that, your cloud service is actually the one that initiates with the Windows notification service. It does this little notify message, which we're going to look at real soon, and now the Windows notification service handles actually communicating with the Windows platform and saying, hey, this user on this app is trying to send a notification via their service, and I want you to go ahead and show it on their screen even though their app isn't running. Okay? Simple as that. So let's look at these uh, steps. One steps one through three, as I mentioned, is your app asking Windows for a channel URI. That channel URI, here's an example of what that's going to look like. HTTPS, bn1.notify.windows.com, etc. That's a sample channel URI. Actually, I've got an ellipsis in there because it's much longer. But that's it. So that comes back to you. You now need to get that up to your cloud service. And now your cloud service is going to use that to figure out how to communicate and represent your app. So your app, step four, your app sends this URI to your cloud service. Step five, your cloud service asks Windows Notification Service, that's Microsoft server, for an access token and then it triggers a push. So this is a two-step deal from your service. Your step has to ask for a token and then it has to trigger a push. So here's what they look like. If, if you like the guts of things, which I do, I love seeing what's actually going over the wire. This is just an HTTP post, and here's what I'm posting. I'm posting um, to this um, push notification service, and I'm passing in two elements. I'm passing in my client ID and my client secret. Now those, you have to go register and get a client ID and a client secret from the live website where you, where you, where you sign up for those. You register for those for your app specifically on your dashboard. This is at dev.windows.com. You register for those, you get those two pieces of information and those uniquely identify your app, okay? You pass those by way of a post message that looks just like this to the WNS and it goes to login.live.com slash access token.srf right there, okay? 
that comes back with a response that looks like this, a simple JSON result that has simply two uh, properties in it, access token and token type. So this access token here is something that you're going to need for the next push notification. <clears throat> so here's your second message. The second message, notice that this is posted to the bn1.notify.windows.com. This is actually posted to that channel URI. It's including this access token that you got in the first step. And when you do that, um, you also pass along a message in that HTTP post. And that message is an HTML template that says what kind of notification you want to do. Now there's a bunch of these and you can research all of those different types of notifications online. Um, but in this case, I want to do a tile square text 03. So this means that I'm pushing a notification that's going to update a square tile on the start page. There's a, a whole collection of different templates that you can pass in as notifications some of them affect the tiles on the start page. Some of them affect the uh, toast notifications. Other affect the badge. And th there's even some other types. Once that's been done, Windows Notification Server sends this to your app. Your app doesn't even have to be running. Okay. Once again, that's at codefoster.com slash anatomy of push. And hopefully that helps you to understand um, what this entire push looks like. But keep in mind that I'm telling you right now the hard way. Hmm. That was the hard way. Okay. It, you, you'll still be involved in a lot of that process, but it's going to be much easier if you use WAMS. What is WAMS? Any idea, my, any idea, my colleague, what WAMS is? It is an acronym. <laughs> for? <laughs> I forgot. Windows Azure <laughs> Mobile oh, yeah, Services. Yeah, that's, that, I knew that. Yeah. I just want to know if you knew that. Yeah, yeah, I knew it. We affectionately yeah. refer to it as WAMS because it's way more fun to say WAMS than it is to say Windows Azure Mobile Services. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's look at how this is going to act how, and what, what our role as developers is going to be when we do this using WAMS because hopefully this is going to make our life a little bit easier. Let's look first at the demo. This demo is, uh, this is a new one, so you won't see this in the Windows 8 app, but you will see it in the source code, and it's under WAMS push. So WAMS push, let's go to it. And this one's pretty simple. I like to keep it simple. Let's just do a little smiley face, and let's push it. We might have to wait just a little bit of time there. It happened already. We hmm. got a toast notification in the upper right-hand corner that is whatever I typed in there. Hmm. Now, that doesn't necessarily show the power of this because I've got my app running. So you're like, yeah, I don't know if you cheated or not, Code Foster. Mm. Maybe you're just pushing this notification from your app because it's running. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I know. I knew, I knew that you were <laughs> suspicious, and so I prepared this demo for us. Oh, okay. <laughs> So in the Code Show app, I'm going to prove to you that this is using the push notification server. I'm going to do that by looking in the WAMS push demo. I'm going to open all three files and show you, first of all, the HTML. Very simple. Just an input and a button. That's all. I'm going to show you the JS. And the JS is actually super simple. Okay, this is super simple because we're using WAMS. So we'll get to see that in just a second. So we use the fancy Q method to find the push. The push is the button, as you can see here in the HTML. And with the push, we set its click. What do we want to happen when it is clicked? When it's clicked, now this is interesting. I'm saying channel operation dot then. I used a little bit of a asynchronous pattern here that I want to bring your attention to. Not that it's exactly on topic, but this is an important pattern. What I, what I want to happen here is I want to tie up something that's going to occur when the user clicks on a button, but it has a dependency. It's required that we have already asked Windows and gotten back a channel URL. So we ask Windows for the channel URL, and here's that simple API that I told you under Windows Networking Push Notifications. I access the Push Notification Channel Manager. Now that Channel Manager has a method called, and here's the, the winner in the long method names category of the day, Create Push Notification Channel for Application Async. What do you suppose that's going to do? It's going to create the channel. And then it's going to return that channel URI to my application. 
Now in this case, it's an asynchronous method, so what it's actually doing is it's returning to me a promise. I'm storing that promise locally here as var channel operation, so this does not actually represent the channel object that I just requested or a string representing the URI, no. Actually, it represents a promise. A promise which is carrying the payload of the channel that I was asking for. And I definitely don't want this user to, when the user clicks, I definitely don't want this thing to happen until the channel operation is already completed, until I've already gotten back this channel. URI. So I simply store here, I store that promise, and then a little later I reference that promise and I say dot then. Now the cool thing here is, in all likelihood, the user is going to open the screen, this request is going to go out, and this request is going to come back long before the user touches a button, right? Many tens or hundreds of milliseconds before the user touches the button. And if that's the case, there's no penalty in go ahead and using this asynchronous pattern because it's going to say channel operation dot then immediately determine that that's already been fulfilled, that promise has already been fulfilled, and so my then function is going to run right away. But it just adds an extra little layer of safety to make sure that I don't run into some sort of an edge case whenever um, the user touches a little too quickly. So what happens when the user clicks the button? They click the button, the channel operation will assume is complete, and so this function will fire. Now this app.client is representing the WAMS context. Okay, WAMS, Windows Azure Mobile Services, gives you a context which represents everything that can happen with WAMS in the WAMS SDK. You can access all the tables, you can, you can do all this stuff that you need to through the context. Now I, in my default JS, have wired up my context, called it client, that's the WAMS client, and I've put it in the app variable. The reason why I did that is because now it's available everywhere. I get to use that on any of the demos in my entire project. I don't have to each time go, you know, try to, try to get access to that WAMS client. I can just do app.client. So I access that client and I'm going to grab this table. WAMS push notifications. I'm going to show you that table, the source of that table in just a second. But for now, just know that I'm grabbing this table and to that table I'm inserting something completely new. And I'm inserting something that is completely anonymous. This is an anonymous object. In JavaScript I just throw curly braces around it and all of a sudden I've got an object. In that object, three properties. Channel, message, and sent. Sent is a boolean, message is whatever the user typed in, and channel is, now I'm accessing this channel object which came to me by way of my promise pattern, okay? So I'm creating this little object and inserting it into this table. Now this is going to the cloud, so now I'm going to have to take you to the cloud. Everybody ready to fly with me? I will take you to Windows, uh, manage.windowsazure.com. You're going to see my instance, my subscription in Windows Azure. And as soon as this is done, I'm going to go generate new keys because uh, <laughs> you're going to see them on the screen. Yeah. Uh, so everybody, shut down your screen capture software right now, if you would, please. <laughs> now we're going to look at, as you can see, I got a lot of activity going on, on in Azure. If you haven't looked at Azure in a little while, you definitely have to. Some of the things that have been introduced, like on a regular cadence since like last April for the last year then have just been really, really awesome. In the area of mobile services, this is one of those things that I am extremely excited about. Now I've got a mobile service that's constantly running and uh, you can get instances of mobile services for free. I think you get 10 of them for free currently. So, And you get Azure for 90 days for free. So go ahead and sign up for Azure real quick and create yourself some mobile services and just play with this at no cost. And you can see that there's some activity here in the last, uh, in the, in the last 24 hours. And I'm going to jump actually over to the data. Now, the mobile, Windows Azure Mobile Services provides to you a bunch of different stuff. You get uh, very cool table support. It's basically a NoSQL model of connecting with um, 
connecting with data, but it's actually still storing it in SQL Server. So you can connect to it with classic means and iterate those tables the way you're familiar with. But you can also push into there and not worry about defining ske your schema, de defining uh, columns before you submit to the table, because we implement what's called dynamic schematization. So super exciting in the data area. You also get to call custom operations in the scheduler, and you get to uh, manage your push notification. You get to manage um, a bunch of identity access so that you can authenticate the user via all these different um, uh, these different means. You can um, configure the, the, the database, and then all of this is happening in Azure. So as soon as the need arises, you just push the uh, push your instances up and all of a sudden you can handle huge traffic because you're you're working on an app that got major major um, popular all of a sudden. That's what you want, right? Okay, so let's actually go look at the data tab and we'll look at this WAMS push notifications table. I created this table here in WAMS, but I get to push to it and dynamically from my app. Now you can see that I've had a bit of activity in here. In fact, there's the little smiley face I just pushed. You can see these columns, channel, message, and sent. These came directly from this object, channel, message, and sent. I never once defined those columns on my, on my table. Instead, I just created this dynamic object and inserted it into my table, and it handled it for me. So you can see that my structure is that I have a channel URI a message, this is what the user types, and then whether or not that has been sent yet, you can see that they're all true. And you have an opportunity for your data to specify some scripts that run, this is on the server by the way, mm -hmm. some scripts that run whenever the user inserts, updates, deletes, or reads from the table. It's really cool. And so the, the model that you were showcasing, uh, which some people may really enjoy this model, is that code first approach to uh, defining what your data entities are going to be. And in that example, you just defined it through uh, JSON, basically. And uh, the WAMS was able to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, we can take that. We I can, can handle that. We can handle that. We'll yeah. just make a table for you. And if at a later point in my app I decide, you know what, I need an extra column on there, I add that column to my object in my JavaScript and the next time I push one of those objects, Wham says, I'm going to need to add another column to this table. Does that for you dynamically, and you're good to go. That's excellent. Yeah. OK, so once again, here we are in the server. So this is really, th this is in the category of backend as a service. OK? B-A-A-S, ba a a a OK? As opposed to infrastructure as a service platform. This is a backend. This is the service that's handling your app data and some of your app logic as it interacts with that data. OK? It all goes across the wire in a really awesome REST-based format. But the SDK that's available on, it's available on Windows Phone, Windows Store, it's available in iOS. And I know that the Android SDK is, is, is a is not far away, as well as a, a generic website uh, SDK. So a really cool connection with this WAM service, with this uh, at Windows Azure Mobile Services. Now, what I'm saying here is that I, and, and, and by the way, I'm writing JavaScript. JavaScript yeah. on the server. On the server. Yeah, does that, does that give you any clues as to what might be behind the scenes here in Windows Azure Mobile Services? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know either. It's node. Node.js is running behind the scenes. So you'll be familiar with some of these, these patterns if you've used node at all. OK, so this insert uh, operation happens. And when that happens, you can either just let the request happen as it will. In fact, this is the way most of them look right out of the box, is just, just that, like that. They just execute that mm -hmm. insert. That's it. But you can override that with your own request execute, and you can do something custom. So in this case, we're saying, go ahead and write that record in the, in the database, and then like, as a success method, I want you to do something for me. So this is going to first write the record in the table. And now, by the way, sometimes you might want to do some stuff and then enter the record in the table and then do some more stuff. But in this case, we just want to go ahead and enter whatever they, I might want to validate the data that they enter. Sure. I might, I might want to look for, uh, look for swear words and make sure that they're not pushing any swear words to the uh, Or scrub the, the data. App. Scrub the data, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But in this case, I'm just writing the record, and then here's what I'm doing. 
I am getting the push notifications table again. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I want the entire table. Each time somebody inserts, I actually look at the entire table to see if there are any messages that haven't been pushed yet. And, and, and I can tell by looking at that sent column. So I use this exciting modern syntax of just saying, get me the table, and then dot where sent is false. So these are the ones that are unsent. And then um, I want to read those records. And when you've got those records for read, I want to run the send function. So as you can see, send is down here. Now, does this wig you out at all that I've got some IntelliSense support in an online IDE? Say what? Oh, yeah. It's pretty handy. That's pretty cool. Yep, you can see that I've got send highlighted here, and it's actually highlighting send up above. OK, so the send function is going to return the results that were read. So this is all the records that have not been sent. And so for each, this is an exciting new ECMAScript 5 array function that I love to use, dot for each, results dot for each. For each of those records, I want the record as R. And here's what I want to do. I didn't have to write this. This is given here for me in Azure Mobile Services, push.wns. By the way, there's push.wns, but there's also push.other uh, services that you can push through. So for instance, if you're creating a service that's going to do notifications on the iOS platform, you've got the, the iOS um, notification service there as well. In this case, I want to use WNS, and I want to send a toast text 01. That's one of those specific XML messages, except you don't have to deal with the XML format, the XML message, anything like that. You just say, send toast text 01, give it some parameters, it puts the whole thing together for you. Very nice. I like it when other people do my work. What do I want to send this toast text you are uh, this toast text notification? First thing I need to send it since I am pushing is the channel URI. So there it is. The next thing I want to send it is the text that that this template, this notification template is expecting. Mm -hmm. So I pass it the message that the user sent. So it, if I can uh, pause you for a moment on that, you said of course the channel URI, but why? What, what is it, what, what is the significance of that channel URI? Okay, so this guy is in the cloud, right? In the cloud, in the sky, mm -hmm. he's up there. This is, this is a server that Microsoft hosts. It needs to know where to send this, and that includes a lot of information. Mm. It needs to know the device where to send this. It also needs to know the user on that device and where to send it. Nice. It could be that mom and dad both have an app installed on the same device, and it needs to know even the user. So right. it, gives, it gives it a lot of context. It's like the phone number to that particular app, so to speak. Exactly, exactly. And that's what this channel tells it. So now it knows who to send this to. So what I send it is this message, and when it's done, I want this success handler to run. So what do I want to do after I've sent that? I want to take this record in my red records, this R, and I want to mark it to true. And then I want to update the record. So look at how nice and easy it was for me to update a record. I got, the, I read the results up here and I'm looking at one of the records and then I can just dynamically set its property to true instead of false and say I finished this one. And then I can push um, that update into the table by calling the update method. Okay? That's cool. So what happens is from my app, I make a message, hello world. When I push, it's writing a record into the WAMS table. Push. Writing a record into the WAMS table, that trigger is firing. It's doing a push notification of that record and setting it to sent equals true, and then that push notification it gets delivered all the way to the client. Awesome. Yeah. I think so too. I think I think awesome is what I think. So this this um, uh, server side backend as a service WAMS is extremely um, fun. It's extremely fun to work in this environment. Um, you'll notice that I can go look at what data I have. I can even see all of the columns that are available. I've got so there's channel message and sent. 
I also have complete control over the permissions that the, that the users have. So for instance, anybody right now with the application key is able to insert a record into this table, but I can limit that and say, no, only authenticated users are allowed to insert into this table. Mm -hmm. That means that you have to not only come to me with the right application key, but you also have to be authenticated. But that's okay because WAMS makes it easy for you to authenticate users. Let's not make that change right now. All right, so let's see if there is anything else in the area of push notifications. That's what I've got. So there is uh, one thing, and perhaps if you can bring it over to my uh, screen, want to just once again put it, uh, give a shout out to uh, Jeff Sanders. Uh, if you're following online with the chat, you'll see that uh, Jeff has been, of course, uh, a hero today. But we, we're also understanding that this is uh, an area where he's spending some time answering questions in the forums, too. So if, if you didn't see the link on that list yet, this is uh, basically it here. It's at the uh, Windows Azure, Azure Mobile Services, uh, the forums here, and, of course, uh, it shouldn't surprise us at all that we start to see, you know, the the rock star himself answering <laughs> questions. He's probably dual tasking and, you know, amazing. So uh, that's one thing on the Windows Azure mobile services. And there's been some really nice links that have been posted uh, for people to go to there. I also want to address the fact that there have been a number of questions that I have to say I think is very cool that there is so much uh, attention and, and activity regarding the Play 2 uh, discussion that we had. Lots of different questions there, everything uh, arranging from uh, you know, what kind of devices are supported and can I broadcast basically one to many and, you know, what are all the rules and, and what are all the things that you can do regarding Play 2? And so, quite honestly, this is one of those topics where I have not gone into every uh, breadth, width, height that there is to do with Every Play 2. Every nook and cranny? I haven't, I haven't done that. I'm excited about this emerging uh, field myself. And so I did find, and I did post that link, but I'm going to put it on my screen. So what you're admitting is that you don't know everything. True that. I, I don't. Uh, but this is, this is a uh, nice screen here. It's the design guidelines for Play 2 receivers. And it's, uh, it's a download, it's a document, it's a white paper that you can uh, get a lot of different information. A lot of the questions that were in there I saw were referenced in content anyway in this document. And I didn't have time to go through and, and answer each one of the questions based on what's there. So I'd say make this a first step for those of you who were kind of excited about the whole Play 2. Uh, download this document, the design guidelines uh, for Play 2. Read that. I, I already noticed that some of you already figured out the answer of some of your questions by saying, oh, OK, yeah, it does this. Uh, but if you, if you still need more information, go there. What I'm telling you is what a great opportunity you've just given to me because I didn't realize there would be so much excitement here. You know, I personally was more excited about the, you know, the, the push notifications. And, but, but the fact that there was so much information on Play 2 and that that was an exciting thing, that's obviously something I'm going to pursue with the idea of saying, OK, now if I throw myself into there, uh, that's, all those questions are going to make a great blog post, uh, blog post because that means everybody else is going to uh, be yeah. interested in that as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that uh, link that Michael shared was to the design guidelines for, push, or for Play 2. That's receivers. Right. And by the way, those those design guidelines, if you just search in the dev.windows.com docs for design guidelines, you get really good white papers that kind of tell you a lot of best practices, how things are supposed to work. So I know sometimes as developers, we get really buried in the technical documentation, and it tells us technically how to do it, but how? why, why do you do it that way? What's the way that it's supposed to work? Those design guidelines are really helpful for that. And another thing that you can search for in the MSDN documentation is for Quick Start. If you, if you type in Quick Start, then it, it walks you through a little scenario, shows you the code, and gets you up to speed real quick. Um, and then, of course, you can download a sample. That's you know even a lot more code. But uh, you can search for Design Guideline or Quick Start and find a whole bunch of really good information on the dev.windows.com. We try to put good information in our blogs, and you know there's good information online. But I always go back to the source, uh, to dev.windows.com, to find the best conclusion 
flows of information on how it is that things are supposed to work and, and how the APIs look and, and, and so on. And there's one more um, source of documentation that I want to point out to you. Um, on my screen, you can see the server script reference for mobile services. Now, when you're working in that mm. online IDE, it's pretty amazing, but it's not perfect at showing you everything that you can possibly do. That's fantastic. And so if, for instance, you're interested in push, here you've got the push object. And the push object has the WNS object, and that's right there. And so you can dive into these, and it can tell you all the things that are possible. For instance, here's a list of all all of the different um, notification types that that we can do. So there's the send toast text 01 is the one that we sent. And so it tells you, here's the XML that it's going to generate. And, um, and here's how to make that call so that you can generate that XML. That's nice. That's a good resource. Yeah. OK, do we have any questions in the um, chat room? on the topics of printing, play to, or push notifications. Or go ahead and drop them now, and we're going to try to take some of those live. Let's see here. Uh, posting of the link that I was showing on, I'll, I'll make sure and put the, right now I'll put the, the two pages that I showed into that particular uh, thread. So I'll do that right now. Okay. Now's the time to post your questions if you want us to read them live. I did mention before, and I want to say it again, go sign up for an Azure uh, account. Um, you'll get 90 days free, and you can see that you actually get quite a bit of usage in that, um, that free period, quite a lot of usage. And then in the areas, two of the newer introductions to Azure, um, on, to Windows Azure, is um, Azure websites and these Azure mobile services. And both of those are really running in the, the same type of instance, and you get 10 instances for free as long as they're in the free mode. And then you can upgrade those. Um, for instance, ramp it up from free to shared, and then finally, um, finally to um, reserved. And now you've got something that's going to handle you know, gabillions, I think, technically. Isn't that technically how many users it'll handle, gabillions? <laughs> yeah, something like something that. Something like that. You know, another thing that I wanted to uh, chat about real quick, and, and I, have, uh, I just posted the link. I, I prefaced it with the word students. And this applies uh, uh, for a while here. If you're a student, if you have student status and you're watching this. If you have an EDU account. That's right. Yeah, EDU account would be the simplest way uh, to uh, know if you're a student. <laughs> uh, then you should be aware of the fact that there is uh, the ability for uh, students right now to really take advantage. If you even make a quick little app, there's an opportunity for you as students to take advantage of a program designed for you. So please check into uh, the link that was posted to the online uh, that can uh, help you for that as well. There's one question here that says, I'm, I'm not understanding which devices are supposed to be supported by um, Play 2 features. Can you mention that here? Um, and as we were trying to say, there's, there's going to be an uh, uh, indefinite number of devices that are going to support this standard protocol. Um, but again, this is not just a, a Microsoft standard. This is a, a community standard. This is an industry standard. And so we're just jumping on to that formulated standards. So there's going to be a lot of devices. I, I'm personally not going to buy a television set again that doesn't have Play 2 support, that doesn't have DLNA. That's right. Yeah, in fact, th that's the thing is uh, I personally don't like to answer questions directly that I haven't personally tested myself. But if I were going to say what I have seen out there as possibilities that I haven't personally tested, uh, even just Windows Media Player playing on uh, a standard you know, operating system could be a target receiver for something from another app. It's possible. Uh, it, it, Xbox is possible. These things are possible. So I, you know, have I personally done it? No. But I have seen that that's the activity of some others. So that gives you, uh, you know, that's unconfirmed reports, but I'm pretty sure that they're, they're pretty uh, strong. Yep. It uh, looks like uh, Jeff Sanders answered correctly the number of push notifications that you can send. It is gabillions. <laughs> uh, actually, there is a, a metering to the push notifications, uh, a reasonable metering that I think that most people, if, if you are maxing out the meter, I think, you're, I think you're using it for the wrong purpose. 
because push mm -hmm. notifications are going to annoy a user very quickly mm -hmm. if they're coming in that fast. And they're just, frankly, going to turn off push notifications for your app, or they're going to install your, uninstall your app. And that's, that's not what you want. I don't want eBay telling me constantly all this information I don't need to know. I just need to know when my item has been outbid. That's the important part. So keep that in mind. The user is the one that needs to be in control. It's user-centric. And, and Microsoft's done a great deal in the platform to support that. But you as a developer need to keep that in mind too so that you're keeping the user feeling in control. Why? Because if the user feels like he's in control, he loves the app, he buys the app, he rates the app. That's right. Your app sells. By the way, that link that you had to the mobile services, if you can post that to the group, it looks like they would like to have uh, that I'll link. I'll go grab it. Which was an excellent, I agree, that's an excellent uh, reference point for the uh, server-side uh, script that you'd write in JavaScript. Uh, who can send a push notification? Uh, it's, it's the same, it's the principle of basically you have a, a, a subscription model where it's aware of who it's sending it to by merit of the fact that something uh, attached to it and said, hey, here's my number, call me, that, that channel. So it's really about how you are engaging with that service in order to get connected to that service. So who can send it is based on how did you get connected with that service. And then, of course, uh, uh, this ties right back into what Jeremy just said, how it gets Receive. We showed an example of a toast notification. That's not always what uh, has to be done. It could be, again, and I'm sure Jeremy mentioned it, but it could be uh, just an update to some local data that the next time the app uh, comes up, maybe it, it reads that, or it could be badge notifications. It can be uh, a tile notification, not necessarily a toast notification, which flies across the screen. That, as Jeremy said, could get probably annoying, and, and I would even turn those off if they were uh, frequent and, and not like, oh, I really should pay attention to that. Like, you know, like you're urgent, I'm losing or winning or whatever the, uh, the, the bidding process is concerned. Um, in the chat room, Manas is asking, can the complete backend for an app be implemented in WAMS, or should it be used for database-related stuff only? Is there any functionality to process the data and generate notification when there's no table modification event? So um, to honestly answer that, I would say that ideally, yes, the complete backend can be created, and no, it doesn't have to be just data-related stuff. But that said, WAMS is new, it's still in preview. There are lots of features that are coming out. In fact, when it was released, it was mostly data-centric. The data triggers were the only thing that could trigger, trigger script to run. Now we have the scheduler, as you could, as I, as I showed you in the in the portal there, and the scheduler with the scheduler you can say I have a script that I want to run every 15 minutes. So instead of me triggering the the sending of those push notifications whenever the user inserted into the table, I could not do anything there, and instead just create a scheduled operation that runs every 15 minutes or every 24 hours or whatever, and now it runs and it handles all of the the messages in that table. The other thing that, and then that doesn't have to just be on a regular schedule, it can be on demand. So you can write an operation and then you as the administrator can just go in and say, run that one right now, and clean this up or whatever that happens to be. Um, and then the, the other statement to the fact that it's not just for data-centric data backend tasks is the idea that WAMS also handles all your authentication. So it makes it really, really simple on the client side to authenticate the user, for instance, by Google. You just go get yourself a developer account with Google that represents your app, and then, um, then all you have to do is do in my case, remember the app.client was my Azure client, so I would do app.client.login. Google, that's all I say. Log in Google, and it comes back to me with my Google token. I'm logged into Google. I'm authenticated, and it only took that one simple line. That's really, really nice. That is nice. And then it, the fact that it gives you all the push notifications and all of that as well, it's just great. Uh, you may have some experience with this one. Is it possible to create a timer for the push on the cloud so we send after? Oh, that's actually what I just answered. Yeah, you can create a scheduled operation, mm -hmm. have that run at, at a certain time. And in fact, if you wanted to create custom increments, I guess you could probably use the next more precise increment and then write your own scheduling in JavaScript. So Sure. And, and uh, you could do that clearly with uh, the background task that we mentioned earlier. That could be uh, a channel for doing that on the client side. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I guess we should. Um, should we take any more messages? Or, yeah, we we could take some more messages. Just break. We can just take a break. Take a break. One hour break. Hour. One hour. 
All right. Let's go ahead and take a break. I'm sure everybody wants lunch, or at least everybody in my time zone. Yes, in my time zone too. <laughs> okay, so take a break. Thank you for joining us in module three. Uh, we're gonna come back after lunch and jump in. I guess module four would probably be a logical next step, huh? It's the next step. All right, we'll see you it. back here. We'll see you.